والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم بسم الله الحمد لله You are watching Way of the Muslim Developing the Muslim character I'm your host Yusuf Estes And for the next little while I would like to talk to us on the subject Of how to be a real Muslim And how to be a better Muslim We're going to be using the teachings of Muhammad وسلم, Peace be upon him So we're going to refer to those teachings Those hadith In our little program today I'd like to start out mentioning uh, something about responsibility. This is a great one to start with because this comes from Omar radiallahu anhu. And by the way, he was a very responsible person. And he said that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Every one of you is a guardian and is responsible for those who are in his charge. So a ruler is a guardian. And he's responsible for those who are under his charge as subjects. A man is a guardian of his family. And he's responsible for those who are under his care. And a woman is a guardian of her husband's home. And is responsible for those who are under her care. A servant is a guardian of his master's wealth. And is responsible for that which his master has entrusted him with. And a man is a guardian of his father's wealth, and he's responsible for what is under his care. So every one of you is a guardian and is responsible for that which has been entrusted. Now, each of us can read this and take something different from it. What I'd like to do is elaborate a little bit about it and think about the first one. What about a ruler? Somebody who's has the responsibility or the authority over a lot of people. Could be a governor or a mayor or the sheriff, or it could be a high politician, a president, it could be a premier, it could be a king. Somebody like this has a lot of authority. But at the same time, he has to remember who gave him the authority. And the ultimate authority is really a law, isn't it? So where did the king get his authority from? Where did the president get his authority from? Or a judge? Because this is a responsibility. Those people need to think about it. Because on the day of judgment, Allah is going to ask them about the people that were in their care. Those that they're responsible for. Not very many of us are ever going to wind up being a king or a president of a country. I doubt that. But at the same time, we are going to have people who are in our care. As a man, I am responsible for my family. And it's not a joke. I have to guard and protect them. This is something that Allah tells us in the Quran, in Surah An-Nisa, that the men are responsible and they're guardians for the women. And this is very serious, the way that Allah is telling us. Now, what about the women? And in the same exact verse, it tells that the women are also very devout and they're very obedient because of this. So they're devout and obedient to Allah and they guard what is their husband's while their husband is away. And this, of course, includes the house and the servants and everything that's there. Naturally, the children. The mother is always responsible for the children. So this is something that makes sense and at the same time it shows us about what is authority and what is it when we talk about responsibility that goes with authority. We talk about the mom, the dad, but also what about the servants? Because a lot of times the servant will say, well, you know, I don't have any authority, but in fact they have a big authority. When somebody leaves you as a servant in trust with certain things, maybe you're a driver, you take care of a car. Maybe you're responsible for the garden or you're responsible for the household things. Or you're a servant taking care of children. That's a big responsibility to have these children in your care. It's not something lightweight in Islam. It's something heavy. And we must be very careful to take care of those responsibilities. Now, at the same time, I want to mention that 
a man has another responsibility for his father's wealth. Just as the prophet said here, and he said he's responsible for everything he's entrusted with. He's a guardian over it. So we shouldn't run away from this topic very quick because this is something talking about all of the human beings. Every one of us has something we're responsible for. Although it's not mentioned in this particular hadith, we're also responsible in front of Allah for our worship because we're supposed to worship on time. We're supposed to establish the salah, ikam salah And we're supposed to be devout in our worship and take care of our prayers and guard that. There's even a verse in the Quran telling us to guard the middle prayer. So as we're responsible for things in the dunya or the material world, we're responsible very much for things in our worship. When Ramadan comes, and we know about Ramadan, don't we? It's the responsibility of each one of us to guard our fasting, to be careful not only not to eat or drink, but to guard against what we say, to guard against how we behave with each other. We have to guard our tongue for more things than just food and drink. Now let's turn our subject to making excuses. You might think when we're talking about making excuses, am I talking about making excuses for me? No. We're talking about making excuses for other people because very often people make mistakes. This is known. But at the same time, we might blame him and say, you know, he did this, he did so and so. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, tells us that there is no one who loves to accept an excuse more than Allah. And because of this, he sent the bringers of good news and the warners. What does that mean? Well, think about this for just a minute. Allah is the one who is very happy to accept an excuse from us, and that is why he sent the messengers to us, so that we can find out what it is we're doing wrong. The messengers tell us what's right, what's wrong, and then we say, well, I didn't know. Okay, that's a good excuse. If you really didn't know, that's an excuse. But now you know, and the thing for us to do is to begin to practice what we know. So we don't need excuses anymore. But we should give excuse to each other. And by that, I'm talking about another hadith the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that we give our brother 70 times 7 excuses. Whenever he does something wrong, he makes a mistake, Give him an excuse, and then give him another, and another, and another. Keep giving excuses. And an example of that is being on time. We should be on time, and we know that. But if you show up on time, that's good for you. But if your brother's late, don't automatically assume, oh, well, he doesn't live up to his word. You know, he's a bad person. Don't do that. Give him the excuse. Could be he got tied up in traffic. Maybe the bridge was so crowded he couldn't get across it. And maybe he had car trouble. That's excuse number two. Maybe his watch stopped. Excuse number three. Maybe he forgot the time that you said or misunderstood it. Excuse number four, five, six, seven. Keep going and giving him excuses. And if you give him 70 times seven excuses, guess what? By the time you get through with all those excuses, he'll probably be there. <laughs> He'll be late, but he'll be there. And then after he's there, it won't really matter anymore. So give excuses to each other as much as you can. This is important. Now, what about hasid? Hasid is, a, in English, we say envy. And this is something mentioned in the previous revelations that we also believe in, by the way, that it is something that is forbidden for us to do, to have envy, to have hasid about something. And this is narrated on the authority of Ibn Masud, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that there is no hasid or envy with regard to things except for two. There's two things that you can envy. What are they? A man who Allah has given wealth to, which he strives to spend righteously, and a man to whom Allah has given the wisdom. This means the Quran. And he acts according to it and he teaches others. Here we're talking about envy in a good sense. 
Obviously, we don't want to have the bad kind of envy. For instance, if a person has a new car, and you saw the new car, and you see your friend in there, and he's waving as he goes by, and you go, Arr, I wish I had that car. Well, that's an envy. That's really not good. Or if you see somebody got a job promotion, and you say, mm, How come he gets a promotion and I don't? This is envy. And these are things that are bad for your heart. And it's not good for the other person either to envy them. It's bad for you and bad for them. But when you see something like this where somebody is being advanced, Allah is helping them, Allah is giving them something, even if he didn't give it to you, don't be envious. Instead, you say what? MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Because Allah wills. Let that be your statement. And then, when it comes to these two subjects here, you can have the kind of envy that makes you want to do more. That is, when you see somebody Allah has given wealth to, and he's spending that wealth for the sake of Allah. In other words, he's giving charity and sadaqah. He's taking care of the poor, the yatim. What he's doing is something loved by Allah, and you want to be envious of that to the extent that you said, you know what, I want to do that too. I would like to have wealth like that from Allah, and if I had it, I would spend it. Or maybe you have some wealth, and you say, by golly, he did it, I'm going to do it too. That's the best kind of envy there is. Spend for the sake of Allah as much as you can. And this is why sometimes when people give, and you see them give, and you say, oh, why is he giving so other people can see it? Well, because when he gives that way, it encourages you to do the same thing, because you say, hmm... Look, other people are giving, I should give too. And this is a kind of envy that's acceptable. In fact, you can get reward because you're seeing others do something and you say, I want to do good too. The other one, when it talks about the wisdom, the hikmah of the Quran, and he acts according to it and teaches others. Do you know anybody that teaches the Quran? Do you know some people who have uh, memorized Quran or they're the Arabic teachers? And you said, gee whiz, I wish I had that. Well, this is acceptable. It's still good to say mashallah, by the way. Don't think that you don't need to say mashallah. But this is the kind of envy you think, mm, boy, I wish I could do that. The other things you don't really want to wish for. Because if you said, for instance, oh, he's got a new car. I wish I had a new car. You know what? If you did have, what if you had an accident? Now, there would be a problem for you, wouldn't it? <laughs> what if you had a new car and somebody stole it? You'd feel horrible. Maybe there's a reason Allah didn't give you a new car. But for sure when it comes to spending in the way of Allah or teaching Quran or helping people to better understand things in Islam, this is something that it's good to envy. It's something that's acceptable at least. And still I want to encourage myself and all of us to do what? Say MashaAllah. Now we're learning from these examples something called the way of the Muslim how to develop a better character as a Muslim. We want to take a break. We want to come back to you and continue this exciting program. Hey, everyone, check this out. If you are confused or surprised or a little astonished or maybe you have questions, about life or the hereafter or maybe you need some help what about someone you can really trust someone reliable feel free to ask Huda We're back. You're watching Way of a Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. We've been talking on the subject of envy in our last segment. I want to pick up now with the reason, one of the reasons that causes envy is when people see extravagance in other people. This is something that happened at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. I'd like to relate that to you. It was the wife of Abu Darda who said to her husband, won't you seek for things to entertain your guest just like other people are seeking for things to entertain their guests? He replies back to his wife and he says, I heard the messenger, that means Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa saying, ahead of you is a steep mountain 
which nobody is going to be able to climb or ascend if they're overburdened. And he said, so I wish to keep my load light for this big climb. What a good teaching this is. Not to be extravagant, not to load ourselves up with things that we really can't afford in the first place, just to try to entertain our guests, to try to show off for people. Oh, look at this. I just got a huge, giant screen television set. Oh, by the way, we don't want you to throw away the TV set because we want you to watch our programs. But we are talking about being extravagant, not getting things that you don't really need just to show off for the guests. Sometimes the wife will try to encourage the husband to spend more money than he can afford. But it's important for the husband to sit with the wife and explain to her that this really isn't what's in Islam. What's important for us is to keep our burdens light in this life so that we'll be able to ascend that big mountain which is coming up. And this is referring to the Day of Judgment. All of us are going to be able to ascend up only if we get rid of these burdens here because Allah is going to ask us on the day of judgment on Yom Hisab, we're going to be asked about the wealth about the favors of Allah the things that he gave us here there's nothing that we have here that we're not going to be asked about by Allah even our eyesight is going to be a favor of Allah that we're going to be asked about so this is important for us to realize that when we are extravagant and we're buying things and uh, acquiring things that we don't really need, and sh especially showing off with it. And then we're going to do what? In the last segment we talked about it, cause envy. So this is a good point for us. Avoid the things you don't really need. If you said, well, I don't, can't afford it, I don't know if I should get it. But you know that you can't afford it, then this is meaning Allah, He doesn't want you to have it. And we should be careful, especially on things like credit cards and buying things at the bank, through the bank, or buying real estate, things like this, that we don't have money for, but we go out and do this just so we can be extravagant, because that will lead to nothing but trouble. And then this is not the good character of the Muslim to do that. Let's move to the next one. We want to talk about another kind of waste. Uh, when we talk about extravagance, there's another kind of extravagance in time. Wasting our time. Because the Prophet, peace be upon him, said there are two blessings which come from Allah that many people lose, and that's their health and their free time. So we need to take from our health before we get sick or ill or become incapacitated. And we need to take from our time while we still have some time to take from you know, often people say things like, well, if I would have known this was going to happen, I would have done so and so or such and such. And if I'd have known that I was going to have that problem or this problem, I would have done so and so. But the time to have thought about that was before we had it, right? So well, you've got your health, get out there and use it for things that please Allah. And while we still have time, we need to take advantage of that before our time runs out. Because there's just so many minutes in a day. And there's just so many days in a week. And before you know it, those weeks add up to months and years. And then all of a sudden our life is gone. So before that happens, let's take advantage of those two things. Our health and our time. I want to come to another very important aspect of Islam. is the things that Allah has forbidden for us the things that Allah has permitted for us. This is uh, a famous hadith that many of you are probably aware of. Allah said, that which is halal or lawful is clear. That which is haram or forbidden is clear. And in between them are doubtful matters about which many people who have no knowledge argue. So whoever avoids doubtful matters saves his religion and his honor. And whoever falls into these doubtful matters falls into what is forbidden. Like a shepherd who grazes his sheep too close to the private pasture of somebody else, he will soon have these sheep straying into it. Indeed, for every king there's a private pasture. Hema. 
Indeed, the reserve or the preserve of Allah are those things which he has forbidden. Indeed, there's a piece of flesh in the body that if it's good, then the whole of the matter is good. But if it's bad, then the whole of the matter is bad. And that piece of flesh is the heart. To elaborate on this one just a little bit, the halal and haram is something in Islam that is so important that Allah speaks about it in the Quran in a very special way. When he talks about the people before us taking their priests and rabbis as partners with Allah, and someone said to the Prophet, peace be upon him, did they used to do that? How? How did they didn't actually worship those priests or rabbis? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes, they did. Didn't they accept from these priests and rabbis those things which were halal or haram and then reversed it, made it haram and halal? He said, well, yeah, they did that. And he said, in the same way that they do that, that's worshiping them. So Allah really hates for anybody to change his rulings and say halal when it's haram or say haram when it's halal. In other words, to make the things which are forbidden to be lawful, or those things which are lawful to be forbidden. For us, as Muslims today, we realize that there's an importance on knowing the difference between what's permitted and what's forbidden. We also know that there is an area in there which there's doubt. Should we do this, or should we leave it? And if there's a subject which makes you doubt, then leave that subject for something that doesn't make you doubt. Leave off those things where other people are arguing and fighting about and be safe in your deen. Be safe in your way of Islam. And this is a good quality of a Muslim, to leave off those things that make you doubt for the things that don't make you doubt. And then additionally, when it talks about this idea of the shepherd grazing his sheep too close to somebody else's pasture. Eventually, you know what's going to happen. Those sheep are going to go into somebody else's pasture. That's obvious. But when we're comparing it here, talking about Allah's hima or reserve that he has, this is something very special, this halal and haram. And the smart one stays away from it. Even the scholars, the big scholars of Islam, become very careful when somebody asks them, is this permitted or is this forbidden? You'll hear them many times start out by saying, stop for Allah, stop for Allah, stop for Allah, which means Allah forgive me, Allah forgive me. And that's before they even give you any answer. And they're going to be very careful to give you the proofs. One of the famous scholars from Egypt was saying not too long ago that it's difficult, more difficult, really, to talk about the things which are permitted in Islam than it is to talk about the things that are forbidden. He said, it's a, suppose I make something forbidden and it wasn't. At least the people will stay away from it, even maybe they didn't have to. But suppose I make something permissible and it's not permissible. Oh, my God. He said, this is really, you know, an amazing thing. So he said that, that it was harder for him to say what's the halal or permissible than it is for say what's that forbidden. I want to move now to something that is um, also very important when we talk about, it's related to this subject, in knowledge. And this is another saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He said, don't seek knowledge just so that you can compete with the scholars and don't argue with the ignorant and don't try to gain mastery over the gatherings, since whoever does that, then, and look how he said it, the fire, the fire. It means this is going straight into hell. And that's the one thing we all want to avoid more than anything else is hellfire. I don't want to go to hell. You don't want to go to hell. So this is a good point for us to pay attention to. When you talk about knowledge, I hear so many of our brothers, and I love our brothers so much who are seeking knowledge, and I pray for them. And I pray for me, too, to get more knowledge. But what's the purpose behind it? And this means we need to have sincerity 
ikhlas in getting this knowledge because the knowledge that you gain is for what purpose? If you want to learn the Quran so you can recite in your salah, that's beautiful. You should. That's encouraged. We mentioned that in another one of our programs. And if you want to gain knowledge in Hadith, if you'd like to get experience and knowledge in the uh, fiqh or the rulings, Islamic jurisprudence, this is encouraged. But be careful what your purpose is. Keep your niyyah, your intention, clean. In our very first program, we spoke about the niyyah, the intention. Whatever you intend is what you're going to have a reward for. But when we're talking about this, there's something even bigger than that, is to keep this knowledge that you're seeking for Allah. There's a famous hadith of the Prophet wasallam that's also mentioning this subject. He said there will be three that come on the Day of Judgment. And one of them will be asked, what did you do with the bounties of Allah? He said, oh Allah, I was a fighter for you. I fought and died in the cause of Allah as a martyr. And he's going to be told, you did it so the people would say you were a great fighter. And they said it. Now you've had your reward, meaning you got it with the people. And then he'd be dragged on his face in the fire of hell. And then the second one would be asked, you had this great life. What did you do with the bounties of Allah? And he'd say, oh Allah, I seek knowledge for your sake. And then dispense this knowledge to others. And then he'd be told, no. You did it so the people would say you were knowledgeable and be dragged on his face into hell. The third was asked something similar about the bounties of Allah. He said, oh, I had great wealth and I spent it in the cause of Allah. They said, no, you did it so people would say you were charitable and they said it. And he'd be dragged on his face to hell. So be sure that we do what we do for the sake of Allah. Let's keep our near our intention for Allah in all things, especially in gathering this knowledge. And then until next time, Remember, it's only Allah who guides. May Allah guide us all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.